Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Radically Loved. Today, I have a very special guest, two times New York Times bestselling cookbook author, Elise Kopecki on the show. Yay. Welcome. Here's the clap track. Yay. Thank you for having <laughs> me. Good to see you. Good to see you too. We, I'm like with my technical difficulties, you know, sometimes I have this thing where I don't know if you know this, but Spanish was my first language when I was little. So there are certain words that I have, I still have a hard time saying them out loud. And I think it's sometimes the two times times thing. Yeah. It trips me up and <laughs> my mind, I, like I say it, it, sometimes when I'm in panic mode, I realize I think in Spanish, is that weird? That's good. Yeah. Andy does the same, like messes up a few words here and there. Cause his first language is French. Yeah. I, I figured that does he, yeah. What, what happens when he, he trips up? Does he just say it in French? Well, no, it just has, he just has like a few words that are like mostly with spelling, like spelling words differently. Oh, interesting. Well, you're here, here you are, and you're here to talk about your new cookbook, which, uh, I'm like, so stoked that it's finally out because I'll go all the way back to the beginning, uh, two books ago when you first, uh, you first were conceptualizing the idea of the first book and you had your proposal together. And I always like to say this, but I knew it was going straight to the New York times from the minute that I saw <laughs> that proposal. Remember we were sitting at Prasad in Portland. You were the only one, you were the only one that thought this would be a bestseller. I just, the, you know what? I was tuned in. I just, from the knew. beginning. <laughs> I did. <laughs> so how, I mean, how is this? So it's rise and run is the name yes. of the book. Let's show everybody. So everybody that's watching uh, the video, I'm going to pin Elise's video here. So you can see rise and run recipes. Hold on. Let me read the little subtitle recipes, rituals, and runs to fuel your day. So tell us about what inspired you to do this specific book, like where, you know, you've already had two New York times bestsellers what inspired you to create this one? How is this different from the other two books? So this is by far our most inspiring book. It's so much more than just a cookbook. Um, it's all about starting your day with mindfulness and resetting your whole day just by changing your morning routine. And the biggest thing is teaching people to prep breakfast the day before because mornings are always busy and rushed. And the only way to have good energy the whole day is to eat a really nutrient dense, delicious, nourishing breakfast. Um, and so every recipe in this book has make ahead tips. Um, and what inspired this book is realizing that athletes, whether you're uh, doing yoga or running your first 5k or no matter your level of sport, athletes are just busy people and need a big hearty breakfast. So we know breakfast is like the most coveted meal of the day, day for athletes. And we wanted to write a whole book of all of our favorite breakfast recipes. And you know how much I love breakfast. I'm obsessed with breakfast. And uh, obviously I, not obviously, but I was fortunate enough to contribute to the book as well. And I think that the morning time for me is the most special magical time of the day. And I love doing my practice in the morning. I love doing my run in the morning. That's usually the time where I feel like the frenetic energy of the day hasn't started, but I can see, especially knowing you've got two kids, like the morning's probably the busiest time of the day for you. So the whole idea of preparing in advance is, it seems like it would be really efficient for a lot of people. Yeah. We were so excited for this book to interview all of our experts in the mindfulness world, including you, um, just to make sure like what we were realizing for our own lives was also what the expert experts in the wellness space were seeing that like starting your day with 10 minutes of yoga or meditation, or just an easy run out in um, the sunlight, setting your circadian rhythm really can impact your whole day. And it's super challenging, if not impossible for working parents to have a slower start to their morning. And so this book gives a lot of tips for that. So how have you been able to uh, for the people that don't know, I've known Elise for many, many years. I can't actually think of how long it's been a very long, we're nearing probably close to 10. I think. Well, I met you when I was pregnant with my first 
baby. So eight years ago. Okay. Eight years ago. Um, how have you been able to write three books and still, uh, manage to write a book during a pandemic? Um, this was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. I was going to text you and just, I wanted to have a chat, but I'm like, no, let's save this for the podcast because I think that a lot of people might draw from what kept you going or where you actually found the time and the energy to do it overall. Like how does a mom of two kids create this, this, the time to be able to be creative and to gain, get new ideas. And also how did you write this book during a pandemic? Yeah, this is the book that I'm most proud of because it was definitely the most challenging to finish it um, during a time period when my kids were at home. I literally had just signed our contract for this book like a few weeks before my kids were all of a sudden at home with me every day. Um, so it's it's kind of funny that I named the book Rise and Run because it became Rise and Write. I would get up you know, at 5 a.m., um, during the thick of like the writing where I need really needed like focus time where I needed my house to be quiet. And so I would like write for a couple hours, like from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. until my kids got up. There was no rise and running. It was all rise and write. <laughs> yeah, I love that because I mean, I, I know how stressful I'm sure that is. And I know that you have a very, um, I don't want to say like you're very like, I don't want to say rigid, but you have this morning ritual. You're very dedicated to your morning routine. You, I mean, I've seen you, you know, going for your runs and being able to maintain the balance and play with the kids and you're making meals and you're doing everything. I always tell Tori, I'm like, if, 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 and when we have children, like I need to pull from Elisa's way of doing everything, because it seems like you and Andy have a really great system to managing being parents of two young kids. Right. I mean, we definitely had our challenges and it got to a point like at towards the end, uh, well, not towards the end, but like halfway through writing the book, um, they decided to move up our deadline by six months. Um, So Andy actually left his job to be like full-time stay-at-home dad. And he had this like big idea that he would be this adventure dad and it would be so fun. And like after three months at home with the kids, he was like, I got to find the next job I get. Like he was just so, it's so hard to be, I mean, shout out to all stay at home parents. It is the hardest job out there. Um, So he was quick to find another job and get back out of the house. But um, thankfully our kids are in school now and we have a schedule, which is the best thing ever. Um, But the tip I give to other working moms is do the hardest task on your list first. Your brain definitely Um, is freshest in the morning. So stay off social media, stay off email and just like, you know, get the hardest thing done first. And then the rest of your day, you can do all the extra little stuff. So I'd always, you know, write in the morning when my brain was fresh and then cook in the afternoons. Like when my kids were in the kitchen with me, I could at least be paying attention to them and do recipe development and recipe testing because that didn't take as much like focused brain power. Did you, you did the same thing that you've done before, right? You had a group of people that were a recipe testers. Yeah, it was awesome. So I have a assistant who's been with us from for seven, eight years since, well, since Lily was born. So seven years. Um, she's been our recipe tester, head recipe tester for all three cookbooks. And um, that's Natalie Bickford. And she's amazing. You remember her from- I love she, Natalie. Yeah. Yes. She cooked a lot of the food at our retreat and helped me with cooking classes and everything. Um, so she was- such a big part of our team this time around with the tight deadlines and my limited work hours. And then also we had a team of volunteer recipe testers. So every recipe in this book gets tested by me like a dozen times and then Natalie, and then our team of beginner cooks that have no skills. We want to make sure that they're able to have success with every recipe. Yeah. I mean, I, all the recipes that I've experienced from all of your cookbooks, including this one have they're so easy to do. I mean, there's nothing terribly complicated and they're all like delicious. I mean, I still, I was telling you the other day that I still cook a lot of the recipes from run fast, eat slow, you know, Mm -hmm. like 
there's just these staples that I usually make at home that are easy to make and they last. It's like, I'm a big fan of cook once, eat twice. That's the same. Yeah. So yeah. And I still make the cashew milk that you taught me how to make, which is delicious. And, um, you know, one of the things that I find, uh, that's really important for me. And I know that a lot of people can relate to this is being able to not put so much pressure on yourself with regard to expectation of like cooking every meal. Like you have to like, you know, I feel like a lot of the times people have this plan in their mind, you know, they have the best intentions of shopping in advance, getting everything and, and cooking everything. Um, and having a fresh meal for every meal. And then, you know, life gets in the way and then they don't, and they start to maybe feel bad about not being able to do that. So I really like your ethos around being able to do things in advance so that you're not, um, you know, stressing out about day of and taking the time if you have a busy day, especially if you're working from home. So what is your, um, what is something in the book that you you do every day that you're like, this is just the staple in my house. I do this. If there's one thing that somebody can make or do, what, what is that? So I make, um, like a double batch of superhero muffins every weekend, every Sunday, they are just the fastest little, you know, grab and go meal that you can have for breakfast, lunch, or a snack, like literally like I was scrambling today and didn't have time for like a sit down lunch. So, um, just to hold me over until I can eat like a bigger meal, I just grab a yam spice superhero muffin out of my fridge and they're loaded with fruits and veggies and complex carbs and protein. Um, and we have got in the new cookbook, we have savory versions that are really high in protein for people who want that to start their day with something savory instead of sweet. And there's just like a superhero muffin for everyone, for every style, for every, dietary concern, every type of, in this next book, we have 24 ver versions of superhero muffins. So everyone can find their, their superhero lifesaver and keep them stocked in your fridge or freezer. If you're, um, our, we go through them in a week. So I just keep them in my fridge, but they freeze really good. And that's like my lifesaver in the morning when I don't have time to, I'm helping like the kids get out the door and I don't have time to sit down and I'm trying to go out for a run. So I don't want to eat something like too heavy. I just um, grab a muffin, which I can eat while I'm making lunches and packing the kids' bags and stuff. Yeah, and I, I just had a vision of Ryan asking for his smoothie. Like, I love that he he remember when you were like, he's like, "Mom, smoothie!" Like, it was just <laughs> the cutest thing. So I'm asking because my ne niece and nephew, I guess my cousin has kids. Is that a niece and nephew? That's a niece and nephew, right? Or my okay. second cousins? Yeah. Anyway, they're little and I make these berry smoothies and they came over one day and I was like, Oh my God, look, this is really delicious. And they would not, they weren't having any of it. And it made me think of, um, this is Elisa's youngest son, but how, yeah. how did you do this? How do you get your kids to try and eat healthier foods? Well, Rylan is super picky. So we do a lot of the same recipes over and over again that I know he's going to eat. Like right now at this point in my life, I don't get to do like really elaborate dinners or try new recipes. It's all like the foods that my kids ate when they were, you know, the first foods that they had is what they want to eat now. So like we do a lot of run fast, eat slow recipes on repeat that I know my kids are going to eat. Um, and I just, I eat what they eat because I'm not going to make two separate dinners. So Raya, Lily ate everything she still does. Like, I thought I really knew what I was doing, but then, uh, Rye came along and he's Mr. Picky and has really thrown me through a loop. So I've had to figure out, you know, things, easy ways to sneak good ingredients in. Like right now he really likes, um, thick smoothies that like have the consistency of ice cream. And to, to get that texture, I throw in like frozen steamed cauliflower and he has no idea <laughs> like he, and he loves it. So strawberries with like banana, frozen strawberries, frozen banana and frozen steamed cauliflower. And then like some milk or coconut water, um, and a few other ingredients. And he like loves these smoothies, but he's oh, had, wow. he's had smoothies since he was really little. So it's easy to get him to try like a new smoothie. 
And same thing with muffins. Like he, he's been eating muffins since the day, the first day he could eat solid foods. So he's always up for these muffins. He knows that there's vegetables in there because he helps me make them. So he doesn't complain about that. And then we make waffles every, just about every morning. I keep like a batch of um, homemade waffles in the fridge and I just pop them in the toaster and oh. my homemade waffles, the recipes in Rise and Run, it's like oat flour and eggs and butter and like all really good things that he loves. So I feel good. I don't mind that he's having something sweet in the morning because I know it's all good ingredients hiding in there. Yeah, no, that's so great. I was curious how you how you were able to manage that, how you were able to do that. So mm-hmm. are you guys planning on doing a book tour? What's the what's the plan here? I know that you were just in Chicago. How was that? Is was this your first event? I saw that you yes. posted how was it? It was so strange and surreal to get back on a plane again. But our event, luckily, we were able to hold it outside. So it felt really safe with COVID numbers still high and um, the fans were just, our our book fans were just incredible. They brought so much energy to the event. Everyone was just like so happy to be there and so grateful to be there. We don't have a very elaborate book tour plan because um, most cities, it's pretty hard to like, like we're, Shalane and I will both be in New York for the New York City Marathon and we're trying to pull together an event there, but there's a lot of restrictions and we don't know what the weather will be in November and doing something outside in New York City is a, like a lot more challenging than in other cities. So yeah, I mean, most of our events are going to be virtual. So we've done a couple virtual events already, um, but we won't, we won't be doing the 12 city tour that, that we did with the first book. Oh, bummer. But I mean, at least there's still the online option for me The I I've still yet to do anything in person the same, right. you know, well, I actually did do an event. It was like a private event here in Malibu. And I think that's when I sent you a text and I I was asking when the next nourish and escape is happening because I'm, I am aching to get back to doing things in person, but it is a very like strange time. You also want to, yeah, acknowledge that there, the numbers for COVID are still really high. And so, um, yeah, we want to be mindful about that. What are you, what are you looking forward to the most right now for the rest of this year? What does the rest of 2021 look for you? look like for you? Um, well, I've been training for my first marathon and I'm <gasps> turning 40 this oh. year at the end of this year. So I'm looking forward to going to New York, November 7th, um, to celebrate the launch of our new book, to celebrate 21 years of friendship with Shalane. She'll be running her six, she's doing six marathons within 42 days. Um, so New York will be her last marathon. So just celebrating like friendship and being back out there and health and the book launch. And we have so much to be grateful for. So I'm just really looking forward to going to, to New York to, as like a culmination for this past two years of hard work, um, to get our book out into the world. Oh my God. That's so, that's so awesome. I'm so excited for you. Wow. So yeah, you've never done a marathon before. No. Yeah. People are surprised. Yeah. I, everyone assumes that I'm a marathon runner because, um, I work with Shalane and she's a marathoner, but, um, long distance, long distances has ne- have never been my thing. Like I always, um, in high school and college raced like 5k distance or shorter. Um, so after college, I was kind of burnt out on training. I had a lot of injuries and health problems and I took a break from running. Then I got into my thirties and I was focused on career and kids and through both my pregnancies and a year of nursing with each kid, I didn't run. So surprisingly, like this was the first year that I've really gotten back into like running consistent mileage. Just it's been hard. It's been great training for a marathon because it's held me accountable when before I would easily say like skip a run. If I, if my kid was homesick or, um, you know, I'm working on a deadline, I would just skip my run and I was still always active and living healthy, but not doing any significant training until this year. Mm, what is your what is your writing process like? I feel like I've not ever asked you this, but maybe I have in private, but not on the podcast. Um, for the book cookbook writing, yeah, just like normally for you know, if you have a deadline, obviously you're what I call gear jamming. You're just trying to get through it. You're trying to just do it. But do you have like a writing process that you have to be in a specific mood or there's a specific time, like when that creativity comes in. Right. Yeah. So 
like I said, I do the writing first thing in the morning because my motivation fades as the day goes on and I have the most energy in the morning. So I always turn off my email, turn off social media. I put my phone in a different room because it's really hard to, you, you know, even if your phone is like sitting on your desk and you're not looking at it, it's still like a distraction. So my house has to be quiet when I'm writing. And so I would do it when the kids are either asleep or not at the house. And um, I always do like the, like if I'm writing a recipe, writing the story that goes with the recipe takes the most brain power and the most focus. So as a warm up, I would start with writing, you know, the ingredients and the, the recipe steps. And then I do the head note, the story that goes with the recipe um, set like separate later. Um, so starting with like easy, easier things to pull together and then going back to the hard writing um, after I get warmed up. But I would also work like in really short bursts of time. I never ever have had longer than like since my kids were born, like my work day is like limited to three hours. Like my, my youngest, um, until this year, he was only in like part-time preschool. So like nine to noon was my window. Um, so I think having a really short window time actually really helps because it forces you to really focus. You can't drag it out through the whole day. And, um, yeah, it just, you have to be like quick with what you're doing. So no, I, I always like to hear, author's process because everybody's is so different. And I'm even more curious with having kids, like where do you even find the time? But you just have to, yeah, you just have to get those bursts of time whenever, whenever you can. Um, I know that you've done a lot of research and, you know, you have this nutrition background and this incredible, uh, culinary expertise do you know how certain foods might affect that like are there certain foods for like creativity or that you can eat to get more of that brain power because I'm sure I mean it might be the same as getting physical power for an athlete are there any foods specifically for like creativity definitely so a big big part of the belief behind run fast, eat slow is all of the healthy fats. And that is so important for brain power. Like our brain needs those good, healthy fats to function optimally. Um, I think a lot of athletes suffer from, um, mental health issues because they're so depleted from so much exercise and running, like run every time you go for a run, you're depleting your body of micronutrients and you're using up, you know, all that fuel. So you have to really just eat a lot when you're training and a lot of like nutrient dense foods and all the good fats. But for me, um, I write best when I have a hearty savory breakfast, like a power bowl with some leftover roasted potatoes and sauteed spinach and, um, scrambled eggs. Like eggs are definitely a brain power food for me, um, or any other kind of protein that has like a good, some good fats in it. So good quality, um, olive oil or butter or coconut oil or like nuts and seeds anything with those good fats in there is going to help with your, your mood and your brain power, especially for little kids. Like their brains are developing so quickly. They really need, um, the good high fat diet and, um, matcha green tea. That's what I'm yeah. drinking right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because I, since having, when I got COVID, I, st I stopped drinking caffeine. I mean, I didn't drink caffeine anyway. I'm a matcha tea drinker, yeah. but I hadn't had it at all. And I was concerned that I would absolutely need, I'm back on it now. Side note. I, yeah. it was my break from caffeine is over officially, but I didn't think that I would have the energy to work out or to go for a run or to have the same motivation, but I totally did. I was getting enough sleep. I mean, sleep is huge. Right. And right and getting a lot of greens, a lot of veggies and doing the type of breakfast that you just described. And I noticed that it really did help me feel energized enough to be able to go for a run or to have mm -hmm. a, a brain demanding day where I am actually having to engage my, my brain. Right. Um, so I think that that's, there's really a lot, some, something to that. Maybe, maybe part of the next book. No, got to have coffee too. I disagree with just drinking <laughs> matcha green tea. Coffee is essential. Once you become a parent, you have to have coffee. 
And getting outside at first light, I mean, you talk about that yeah. in um, just going out for a brisk 15 minute walk or getting the sunlight exposure that wakes up your body. So um, taking the dog for a walk or getting in like a short two mile run, even on days when I don't have time to run, like I'll just get outside and get that sunlight because that helps wake me up so that I can focus better. It really does. I mean, the whole sun ray experience, it really does change your mood. It really changes your energy levels. I mean, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to not change my energy or my attitude when I go and I sit outside in the sun, it just completely turns everything around. And the nice thing where you are in Bend, you guys mm -hmm. get a lot of sunlight. Yeah. But it's starting to get cold. Like I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to bike my um, four-year-old preschool this morning. Cause that helps wake me up. I didn't have time to go for a run today and it was 28 degrees. And I was like, we're driving. <laughs> I forget how cold it gets up there right now. Yeah. It's like 67 and I'm freezing 28 degrees and sunny. Doesn't really <laughs> inspire me to, to bike, to bike to school. Well, I am so grateful for you as usual. Uh, one final question that somebody asked not too long ago because they knew I was interviewing you was when are we doing the next nourish and escape retreat? And, um, I'll leave it. I mean, I'm happy to do it anytime, but it's a question. So what do you think? Should we put it on the, should we put it on the list of potentials? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to like, it takes so much effort, as you know, like putting on an event and retreat, and it's just hard to know like where we're going to be next summer, but I hope that we'll be in a place where we can have retreats in close quarters where everyone's staying together and living together. Um, but I have this, like, I just feel like we're stuck in this COVID thing for a long time. So I haven't been like super motivated to, yeah. to get back I, into events. I definitely think that we, whatever, I'm no expert at all, but I definitely feel that we will hopefully be able to get back to that. It's never, ever going to be the same. Of course. Like I think things yeah. have completely changed. And I think that it's good that things have changed because it's just making us more mindful of our health and about the health of others. And I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a forever an optimist. So I'm, I'm hopeful that things will, will start to open up in a way where people are going to be more, uh, comfortable with, with traveling and doing something. Right. Public. Right. Yeah. I think people will have the itch to travel internationally, hopefully getting back out there. So thank you so much for being on as usual. I am so excited about this new book. Again, it's heading straight for the New York Times. So I can't wait to be right for a third time. I'm putting it out there. And um, I'm going to ask you the final question. I'm curious if it has changed. So the final question is, how do you feel radically loved? Oh, gosh, I forgot about that. You always ask that. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, my youngest, my boy, Rylan, he's four, he just turned four. He is the most passionate, funny, like loving kid ever. I honestly didn't know like someone could love, like he, I am his entire world. And he, like the love that he gives me has, is just so inspiring. Um, so he makes me feel radically loved every day. Like I just cannot drop him off at preschool without tearing up because he gives me the biggest kisses and hugs and I love you mommy and like I just feel so loved by that kid he's just has such an incredible personality oh, I love that so <laughs> much thank you again for being here the name of the book is called rise and run we'll put the links to purchase the book let's see lift it up again so if you're watching the video you can Yep. Check it out right there. And, um, we'll put the link to, uh, to the website where you can purchase the book and where to follow Elise in the show notes. If you're watching the video, it'll be in the description below. Thank you all so much. Please, uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review, share this with your friends, and we will be back next week. All right. Thank you, Rosie. Have a good you. rest of the day. You're the best.